good morning everybody and uh, in this busy sunday i invite everybody um, for a very meaningful and um, what is called highly pertinent and uh, um, important topic um, for the webinar of the day the resource person is a person of high caliber he made a mark in the field which he is ruling for the past over a decade dr pavan dugal practicing advocate at the supreme court of india mr pavan dr pavan is the chief executive of artificial intelligence law hub he is also the founder and chairman of international commission on cyber security law and cyber law summit he has been working in the pioneering area of cyber law cyber security law and mobile law besides being a practicing advocate at the supreme court of india dr pavan reputation is well etched in the history of legal fraternity as an expert and authority on cyber law artificial intelligence and e-commerce law world domain day wdd has recognized dr pavan as one of the top 10 cyber lawyers in the world and he is the consultant to uncitad and unescap on cyber laws and cyber crimes he is also the president of cyber law asia an organization committed to enacting dynamic cyber laws in asian continent dr pavan delivered speech at high level policy statement at the world summit on information society wsis <clears throat> that was organized by unesco in may 2015 at geneva he has also addressed a lot of international fora on artificial intelligence legal and policy issues including the octopus conference held at geneva at france in the year 2018 dr pavan has authored a coveted book titled artificial intelligence law artificial intelligence and cyber security law artificial intelligence cyber crimes besides a book on cyber law and artificial intelligence dr pavan has also authored another book on the legalities concerning artificial intelligence titled cyber security laws thought on internet of things iot artificial intelligence and blockchain most important achievement of uh, dr pavan is also in the acad academic area dr pavan's courses on cyber security law at udemy has more than 1500 students enrolled from 165 countries of the world he is also conducting online courses including artificial intelligence law cyber security law in the western world dr pavan is a member of the board of globe ethics net interested in the field of applied ethics he is also a member of panel of arbitrators of the regional center for arbitration kuala lumpur asian domain names dispute resolution center at hong kong dr pavan is associated with ministry of commerce and information technology of government of india on cyber law and e governance issues he is also a member of the advisory committee on e governance of the government of karnataka running a law firm called pavan dugal associates with extensive practice in areas that include cyber laws bpo laws ipr and it laws information security law defense biotech and corporate law and dr pavan is a regular person on the spotlight in the lecture circuit also he has spoken at more than 2000 conferences seminars and workshop in the last 7 years he has lectured extensively in select premier law colleges in the country he has authored more than 130 books on various aspects of law for the past 20 years and last but not the least his weekly column titled brief cases in the economic times on diverse aspect of the law is one of the very famous columns of the country the list of achievements and laurels of dr pavan goes on and on and on um, now i have the pleasure of inviting dr pavan um dr pavan the forum is yours welcome thank you mr chairperson thank you for this opportunity uh and it's my privilege and honor to come and 
uh, be a part of this uh, Sunday morning meet. It's surprising to see how many uh, lawyers take out time on a Sunday during the lockdowns just to uh, gather some more perspectives. See, I believe all of you are practicing advocates and judicial officers and you're all familiar with the law. So my purpose was just to sensitize you about certain things that I'm seeing on the horizon and uh, how that's likely to impact all of us in the legal profession, both from the side of practice as also from the side of uh, the judiciary per se. So I thought I'll talk today morning about increasing cyber crimes and cybersecurity breaches during COVID-19, a legal perspective. Uh, before we actually begin, one thing is very clear. We have never seen something like COVID in our lifetimes. And I'm pretty confident that we will never see something more severe like this in the coming times. And uh, COVID-19 has been a game changer. Let me begin with a, a news that's come in yesterday. Uh, personal data of 2.9 crore Indians have been leaked on the dark net. That also for free by cyber criminals. Is that a way to teach a lesson to Indians that you are not very conscious about your data? So learn your lessons the hard way. Because typically cyber criminals would want to uh, go ahead and sell your data, get some money out of it. But right now, when you release 2.9 crore Indians data and you release it for free, I think it's a bigger message that's coming across. And I believe we need to keep that into consideration as we move forward. Well, I believe uh, this particular uh, lockdown period has been unprecedented. Corona per se is also unprecedented, primarily because when I uh, talk in the terms of uh, what Thomas Friedman says, life after Corona will always be seen as BC and AC. That's life before Corona and life after Corona. That's going to be the game-changing impact of Corona. Now, during this last two months, when more than a billion plus people of the world were forced to be in, on national lockdowns, we quickly realized that a lot of things were happening. The first things that we began to start realizing was that cyber crimes started increasing at a very rapid pace. And this is not what we are saying. This is what the UN uh, disarmament chief has uh, also endorsed that the cyber crimes have been on the rise during the pandemic. In the context of India, I particularly uh, can say that the last two months have been the golden period for cyber crime in the country, primarily because we have never seen in the last 25 years, ever since internet was introduced in the country, of a period where there has been such massive and fertile growth of cyber crime across the world. And consequently, these internet cyber crimes and internet crimes have grown manifold during the lockdown. It's not only done by uh, individuals, by adults, but also by children. Children are doing cyber crimes and at the same time are becoming victims of cyber crime. Let's take this uh, most famous case of boys locker room. This uh, almost um, shook the entire conscience of the nation. Why? Because the kind of language that was used, boys planning to gang rape girls, then planning to make them pregnant and do a variety of completely unwarranted content and things. Now, fortunately, the Delhi police did register an FIR, but uh, investigations revealed that one of the boys who was actually doing the talking on uh, the boy's locker was not a boy, but actually a girl who had impersonated the account of a boy. So. I've actually seen a digital divide emerging in the national lockdowns. Families have been now divided, primarily because children have gone ahead and used unauthorized, uh, shall I say, unsupervised access to the internet. And consequently, their communication gaps with the parents have massively increased. No wonder with so many fake accounts, a plea has been filed in the Supreme Court to curb fake accounts and misinformation on social media. Well. When I look at social media, people have been very active. Uh, they have been writing all kinds of posts. In this case, one guy was arrested by the cybercrime division for sharing morphed images to har harass a political worker. And 26 uh, social media posts were deleted. In Chennai, 
the Chennai police actually booked a photographer for a video tweet on uh, health secretary, which was patently defamatory and uh, was not in accordance with the requirements of law. This is a trend not only happening in India, but happening globally at large. Here is a case from the UK where uh, the Medford teacher has been arrested for sex crimes because he was using uh, Snapchat for the purposes of communicating sexual content with a variety of his students and girls per se. When I look at the global landscape and the Indian landscape, I, fee I see far more activity of cybercrime on social media. These are some snippets of different cases which have been uh, reported in the vernacular media of how people are being booked for what they are actually publishing. Actually, COVID-19 has created a fear and a panic ecosystem and people want to thrive on that. Consequently, they are going ahead and uh, uh, distributing all kinds of uh, content on social media for the purposes of either alerting people or for creating more fear, panic or the like. So big has been the trend of cybercrime that uh, the Delhi police has actually now issued an advisory against cybercrime amidst the coronavirus crisis. They've also come up with a list of dangerous websites, which you should not go. Most of these websites invariably are focused on the, the term Zoom. Uh, and you may tend to click on them and often become a victim of cyber criminal activities. Well, the number of cases that are being lodged across the country are constantly increasing. As per one report, 500 cases have been lodged on social media posts, only on COVID-19. Now, these are cases where people have shared false, fabricated, forged information about coronavirus, which has had a detrimental impact upon the minds and uh, the psyches of people. Further, in, uh, as per this report in Maharashtra, more than 400 cybercrime cases have been filed only on COVID issues. So the numbers are differing, but clearly, when I look at the national average, it's a staggering one that's coming across. So what's new? The new is cybercrime stores are coming up. We were familiar with malls and stores, which we can't go to today, but cybercrime stores are available online, which provide you access to all kinds of cyber criminal activities and content. Arogya Setu app has been into so much of a controversy uh, these days, primarily because of the immense legal challenges that it brings across. The intentions are noble. Nobody doubts the government's intention. But when you read through the terms and conditions and privacy policy, you quickly realize that uh, this particular app is not in compliance with the Indian cyber law, being the Information Technology Act 2000 and rules and regulations made thereunder. Further, it does not even substantially comply with the parameters of cyber security and privacy, which have been stipulated. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have downloaded this app, but do you realize this app is gathering and collecting your information every 15 minutes? But this app does not say anything about what happens to that information. It only says the time you test COVID positive, that's the time your data would be sent in an encrypted form onto the server. But all this time, say from today till the next 21 days or one month when you have not tested positive, your data is going every 15 minutes. Where is it going? How is it being accessed? These are very, very pertinent questions that are beginning to throw up. When I look at the, uh, the global ecosystem, I find globally countries, organizations, institutions are at stake under attack. All kinds of cybersecurity breaches have happened. And this is a symptom of the growing cybersecurity breaches that, are, that we are beginning to see in the context of the coronavirus age. Let's take the case in India. This company called Cognizant got uh, hit by a massive uh, ransomware attack, the maze ransomware. And so severe has been the attack that the company has already, as of date, lost more than 550 crore rupees. And the losses are still continuing to keep on happening. So, and this is a reported case. I, see, I know of many cases which I'm handling for clients, 
which have not been reported, but which tell you uh, definitely not a very pleasant picture of what happens on the ground. I think a new feature that's begun to start coming in in the COVID-19 times is cyber criminals targeting electricity grids, electricity systems, national grids. Here, uh, there was a big attack on the UK electricity system that was reported. Uh, also in uh, Latin America, we saw a big attack. In India, we have not seen any reported instances, though I believe a lot of activity appears to be ha happening. We are all lawyers. We deal with client information. And imagine if we get hacked and our client information gets uh, unauthorizedly accessed. Now, this is what happened to this US law firm, which has been representing all the top big Hollywood celebrities. And they have found that the entire data of these celebrities has gone, including that of Lady Gaga and Madonna per se. So here is a learning. If we think we are lawyers, we are judicial officers, and we are exempt or immune from cybersecurity breaches, think again. If you and your data is compromised, it could have a prejudicial impact on a lot of activities that we would be landing up doing. Kerala has come up with the highest number of cyber attacks during the lockdown period. Further, uh, this Isaka study actually says that the uh, COVID-19 period has actually pushed up cyber attack numbers globally and specifically in India as well. It's not just uh, electricity, electricity systems that are under attack. It's not just lawyers who are under attack. It's airports, hospitals, which are under attack. The Prague airport got uh, massively attacked by a big cyber attack. And uh, of course, it was thwarted. But it all began in, on 15th of March 2020, when this uh, hospital in the city of Bruno, the Bruno University Hospital in the Czech Republic, got attacked by a massive cyber attack. Now, this is no normal hospital. This is Czech Republic's biggest. So when you go ahead and you uh, have such a severe attack that the entire hospital is forced to shut down its network, its systems, and suspend testing, I think you are pointing out to a different ball game altogether. Nobody is immune, not even the US. So in the US, the Department of Health and Human Services have also been attacked by a massive distributed denial of services attack that's happened. Further, we are beginning to find attacks on energy players. In Europe, a big energy player has actually been asked to pay $11 million uh, because they have been hit by a massive ransomware. In India, Cognizant, of course, is being featured in the list per se. Further, there's a new report that tells us that there's a China-based group, and that's hacking Asia-Pacific governments. So it's no longer just individuals. It's no longer just organizations. It's now governments that are under attack. So what's happening? Actually, it's all an atmosphere of fear and panic. And cyber criminals are increasingly weaponizing this fear and panic for the purposes of going ahead and terrorizing people. Already people are afraid. They are uh, very tentative. On top of it, you target them, they become very, very easy prey. Consequently, these cyber attacks and cyber incidents continue to keep on growing. Now, so much uh, significant has been the growth that in the prime minister's office, the, the cyber chief, uh, which is the national cyber security coordinator, he's actually issued cyber advisory for online users uh, because there's a massive increase of cyber crimes. While the government is trying to fight it, the legal system and the legal frameworks are not very well equipped to deal with such kinds of mechanisms. So today, when you are in lockdown, what do you see? You see TV, you go to the internet. Netflix has become so popular in the country. So when you get an email saying Netflix is offering you one year's free subscription, you will automatically click on it. And the moment you click, you become victim of a phishing attack because a computer contaminant comes into your system, your device steals your data, and lo and behold, your data is compromised. So everybody is under attack. Here is a case of a cryptocurrency platform uh, block fee, which has also become a victim of a cyber security breach or a data breach. So the learnings are very clear. 
nobody is going to be exempt from either these increasing cyber crimes or cyber security breaches. I think the national lockdown got in a new era of work from home. People were forced to work from home. Indian companies were not prepared, but then started working from home. This at a time when India was not prepared for adopting the work from home scenario. There was no legal framework. We didn't have a data protection law. We did not have a law on privacy. So consequently, we've begun to start seeing that cyber criminals have begun targeting people working from home, targeting their devices, targeting the computer systems, and making them victims of all kinds of uh, attacks like phishing attacks and other stuff. We are also dependent now on uh, platforms like Zoom. But now, things are getting better. It was about three weeks back, I was on a Zoom uh, meeting with uh, some German scholars. And lo and behold, uh, the host suddenly found that somebody had been able to come inside, uh, crash into the Zoom meeting, what we call a Zoom bombing, and was able to display pornographic content, which led to the disruption of the meeting. Last week, a group of lawyers were meeting up in Delhi on uh, one of these platforms, Zooms, and uh, quickly they realized that some people from Africa were able to come inside the meeting and were able to make such huge audio noises that the meeting had to be adjourned. So I believe the entire issue of cybersecurity on video conferencing assumes more significance. But if you are as a lawyer or as a judicial officer using video conferencing, then I think you will have to be slightly more prepared because video conferencing now, apps have become the new playground for cyber criminals. They have quickly begun realizing that uh, these uh, apps are providing humongous volumes of not just normal information, but also of confidential data, including data pertaining to companies, to corporates, and to clients per se. The work from home has brought in new challenges uh, for the legal fraternity. How do you protect data? How do you ensure personal privacy and data privacy? And uh, what are the legal frameworks currently in place? Are they well-equipped? Does the IT Act alone uh, really suffice for covering all issues pertaining to work from home? Our learnings have been very quickly telling us, no, our legal frameworks are not adequate and we have not been able to focus much on that. Primarily because we don't have yet a law on cybersecurity. Uh, the Indian IT Act has been uh, amended in 2008 to provide a definition of cybersecurity, but it only provided with cosmetic provisions on cybersecurity. So in the absence of a national law on cybersecurity, we find that we are always going to be under some kind of a detrimental impact. But we are not alone. When I look at the international level, I find that there is no international cybersecurity law in place. So different countries have begun to start coming up with their own distinctive national legislations on protecting and preserving cybersecurity. The leader in this space has been China. China in the last three years has come up with three distinctive national legislations on cybersecurity, and they have given a very distinctive twist. They say their cybersecurity is part of national security and therefore is governed under this law. They have in the last one month come up with new rules on uh, this cybersecurity laws. Russia has come up with a data localization law. Vietnam has come up with a distinctive law, which defines for the first time the legal concept of a national cyberspace. Now, we thought cyberspace was global, but according to Vietnam's law, the entire internet is a national cyberspace. And the entire internet is the field where the Vietnamese law is going to be made applicable. When I look at the global figures, I'm finding that the, there is massive spurt in cybersecurity breaches. And these kind of figures are going to give you just an idea of the growth that's happening in ransomware damages and the costs that are connected therewith. The problem is at an international level, there is uh, no uh, common minimum denominators of what really constitutes uh, the protection and preservation of cybersecurity. Therefore, at the International Commission on Cybersecurity Law, which I'm chairing, we are trying to work on common minimum denominators of legal principles, which could be used for the purposes of uh, countries coming up with enabling legal frameworks to deal with promoting cybersecurity. 
this particular slide is going to just give you a, a peep of what the future is. I've written a new book. It's called The New Cyber World Order Post-COVID-19, which is up on Amazon. In this book, I've said that irreversible changes are happening in cyberspace. While we have been busy trying to fight COVID-19, governments have begun, started increasing the ambit of their powers. And this is impacting cyberspace. So when the fight against cyber, uh, against COVID-19 comes to a close, we will be entering into a new age in cyberspace. That new era will be known as the new cyber world order because things will be completely different. Uh, states will become very powerful. There will be far more interception and monitoring. The digital liberties will be much more uh, constricted. So it will be a new ground change reality that we'll have to be prepared for for the life after COVID-19. And when I look at the list of countries who are increasingly but quietly coming up with more legal frameworks to get more control on their uh, st states, on their population, and these are the list of countries which have come up with very effective but very uh, enlarging legal frameworks so as to promote uh, state control. Ultimately, it's all a fight towards protecting cyber resilience. But uh, what and which direction this ultimately takes is anybody's uh, guess. So we will have to just be prepared for these new ground realities. And in these uh, changing times, I believe cyber law is going to play a very, very important role because this is the only discipline of law that's going to deal with the data and information in the electronic form. It not only deals with the legalities pertaining to cyberspace, but also the digital ecosystem as a whole. So in case if you're using any of the seven raw materials, that's you use computers, computer systems, computer networks, computer resources, communication devices, as also data and information in the electronic form, you are going to be covered with the cyber laws. This is yet another uh, figure which tells you of how the cyber attack categories are growing in each particular region of the world and the entire world per se. Well, <clears throat> this figure had told us that the cost of cybercrime globally would uh, go ahead and touch more than 6 trillion US dollars by 2021. But mind you, these are old figures. As per the new estimates, which have been revised, it's now being suggested that we will cross this global cost figure of more than $6 trillion by the end of this year. That's 2020. That's just to give you a sample of how things are happening. <coughs> Artificial intelligence is coming in a big way. And I believe that a uh, lot of artificial intelligence would be used and is being used in COVID-19 times. But it will bring across its own legal nuances of how to deal with this, world, including now increasing use of artificial intelligence in electronic governance and even in uh, legal processes. For example, in Estonia, they're using artificial intelligence for purposes of deciding uh, these small commercial claims up to a particular amount of, I think, uh, $500 or something like that. Similarly, they've started using artificial intelligence in the cyber court in China per se. On top of it, we are beginning to find that during this COVID-19 times, a lot of people have begun started increasing reliance upon the internet of things. These smart TVs, smart refrigerators have become our lifelines. Mm -hmm. but these are constantly collecting our data. So there are huge issues on cybersecurity because a lot of attacks are taking place using the internet of things and we need to protect our own data. Blockchain as a technology is slowly maturing up. A lot of work is happening even prior to and during the COVID-19 times on blockchain. And I think that should also be an important issue in the coming times as we go forward. A lot of people believe quantum computing is many years away, but I believe the uh, quantum computing has begun to start making an impact. It's also helping us potentially to discover new vaccines in the next few days. Now that's the huge volume of quantum computing. And of course, the legal nuances that it brings across. I believe these uh, COVID-19 times have seen an unprecedented push towards facial recognition. Almost all of these COVID-19 tracing apps are recognizing you through your face and are also going at and collecting a lot of your information. So consequently, well, there is so much of it monitoring happening. People are saying, okay, I'm sick of this. Let me go on to a space where I cannot be monitored. So I'm seeing a 
migration of large number of people onto the dark net, both for legitimate and for illegitimate purposes. Needless to say, dark net is bringing across its own distinctive new legal challenges which need to be appropriately addressed as we go forward. Well, whether we like it or not, in these COVID-19 times, fake news has become more and more central uh, in our lifelines. We are often so much flooded with information that we cannot make a distinction between what's normal news, what's good news, and what's fake news. And most of the time, we land up in a hurry or in a panic trying to spread or disseminate fake news at a time when India does not have specific legal parameters to deal with fake news. We believe WhatsApp is our lifeline. I believe WhatsApp is the national religion of India because no other uh, element has united India so much in recent times as WhatsApp. But please understand that while WhatsApp is telling you that it's end-to-end -end encrypted, it still does not give you the complete picture. It's not that it's secure. In fact, it says that whatever you're publishing on WhatsApp, which is audio, video, image, or text, is public information. And they are sharing all your information with Facebook and Facebook group of companies since the last almost four years. The, when I look at the landscape globally and in India, these are the broad cyber crimes that I'm beginning to see happening on a regular basis, whether it's a distributed denial of service attacks, botnets, identity thefts, cyber stalking, social engineering, potentially unwanted programs, phishing, prohibited illegal content, pornography, online scams, exploit kits, hacking, virus dissemination, webjacking, financial frauds, salami slicing attacks, software piracy, ransomware, and online defamation. All of that is happening in our country while we are being complacent in our day-to-day -day lives. It's not hit us, good for us, but it's, it's spreading very, very rapidly like the COVID-19 infection. Cyberbullying has become the number one uh, headache for educational institutions in the country because uh, children have suddenly found a wonderful way to give vent to their sadistic tendencies. Cyber stalking has massively increased. Uh, children are being stalked, adults are being stalked. And uh, that's obviously having a detrimental, prejudicial impact upon the, the mental well-being of people. Cyber harassment has grown many fold in the country. And with more adults and also children accessing internet quietly or uh, without the company of others, they're often alone. So therefore, they becoming fertile victims of cyber harassment becomes a logical default option. You go, you go to uh, Twitter, you find trolling happening left, right, and center. There are troll armies going across who have vested agendas. And therefore, that also constitutes a big cyber crime trend that I see on the Indian ecosystem. Well, I think, is society changing or is our morals changing? Uh, children don't, and even adults don't mind doing all kinds of sexting because when nudity has started coming into uh, our bedrooms, uh, thanks to uh, TV channels and all kinds of erotic programs, uh, people believe sexting is very, very innocuous. Little do they realize that when you are actually sexting, you are committing an offense under Section 67 of the Information Technology Act 2000, punishable with three years imprisonment and fine. So, friends, I think as lawyers, we all know, but... Uh, uh, even if you're not a lawyer, you still need to know that cyber law governs all of our activities today in the electronic ecosystem. Well, I will go further to say that according to me, the Information Technology Act 2000 is one of the three most significant pieces of legislations in the history of independent India. The other two, of course, being the Constitution of India and the Indian Penal Code. Why do I say this? Anything pertaining to the electronic format is covered under the Indian cyber law. Section 81 of the IT Act says it's a special legislation and the provisions of the same prevail over anything inconsistent therewith contained in any other law for the time being in force. So the law was never really meant for COVID-19. It was meant for promoting e-commerce 20 years back, meant for giving legality to the electronic format. But lo and behold, it also had defined various cyber crimes under chapter 111. It also uh, provided for uh, offenses like computer related offenses, tampering with computer source documents, 
electronic uh, pornography, and of course, identity theft and a variety of other cyber crimes. The Indian IT Act also has provided a ground for seeking damages against the perpetuator who goes ahead and commits cyber crimes against you. These damages are up to five crore rupees per contravention under section 43 of the IT Act. The IT Act has now come up with a new concept of an intermediary. Now these are all service providers. Typically you would think the Bharti, the Airtels, the BSNLs are the intermediaries. You're mistaken. Uh, actually the law has come up with a very, very broad definition of intermediary. Any person who on behalf of another person receives, stores or transmits records becomes an intermediary. If you provide any service with respect to that record, you become an intermediary. If you are a company providing work from home during COVID-19, you are an intermediary. The IT Act says, please exercise due diligence while you discharge your obligations under the law. Now these must be done in terms of ensuring compliance with the parameters of the IT Act and rules and regulations made thereunder. Now, if you're an intermediary, the IT Act follows the, uh, the lines that are provided by the Gita discourse in Mahabharat. Well, in Mahabharat, Lord Krishna, while giving the Gita discourse said, come to my Sharan and I will protect you. I think the IT Act has an exactly same message. They say, come inside my ambit, comply with my parameters, my provisions, and I will guarantee you that you will not be forced to pay one rupee damages by way of compensation, you cannot be sent to jail. Now that's all been in, inscribed under section 79 of the IT Act, which has been upheld in its constitutionality by the Supreme Court. But the problem is, despite the law providing statutory exemption from legal liability, most of the companies in India comply with the IT Act in breach rather than in compliance. Then a couple of years back, 2015, we had the Shreya single judgment, which said that, look, Section 66 of the IT Act, A of the IT Act was illegal, set aside, but Section 79 was upheld and so were the provisions of the IT rules per se. What happens uh, if uh, a company who is an intermediary does not comply with the law? Well, they could be exposed to civil liability to pay compensation by way of damages uh, up to five crore rupees per contravention. Further, there could be criminal liability uh, in terms of being exposed to imprisonment up from three years imprisonment to life imprisonment and a fine from one lakh rupees to 10 lakh rupees. The government in the year 2011 had come up the, with these four distinctive rules which impact uh, all activities in the digital ecosystem. These are the IT rules 2011, and they're equally relevant today, though they have not been updated and need to be updated. For example, uh, one of these rules actually is asking all uh, intermediaries to report any cyber incident and share information related to such cyber security uh, incident with the Indian Nodal Agency on Cybersecurity being the Computer Emergency Response Team. At this juncture, I just want to sensitize you something about video conferencing because as lawyers, we are now increasingly using video conferencing, not only for connecting with people, clients, but also for purposes of addressing arguments in courts. And increasingly, courts have begun to start using video conferencing in a big way. When I look at globally, when is judiciaries in different parts of the world have uh, been using video conferencing, whether it's the US, whether it's Hong Kong, or even in Jamaica. So it's but logical that the Indian judiciary would also be using uh, this entire issue of video conferencing. But the problem in India is we have not addressed the data protection issues of video conferencing. Also, confidentiality of data becomes important. Well, yesterday there's been an announcement that CDOT of the government has now come up with a new video conferencing platform that the government is beta testing, and that should increasingly be used by the courts. Currently, courts are using WebEx or earlier they were using Zoom, but we've begun to start realizing that all our data is going outside our territorial boundaries and are being accessed by agencies, uh, which could prejudicially impact India's sovereignty and security. The Zoom has been the, the shall I say, highlighting point as far as uh, these video conferencing problems are concerned. 
we've seen so much a backlash against uh, some of these providers like Zoom. A lot of countries, a lot of organizations had initially banned Zoom and now are re-looking at it. The government of India had said, look, Zoom is very, very unsecure. Please don't use it. So, uh, well, the fact remains is that while Zoom has got the maximum kind of media highlighting, it is also very, very clear that Zoom has been very proactive in terms of constantly trying to increase and uh, update its cybersecurity ramifications. Despite the same, we find that in Singapore, Taiwan, Germany, India, Zoom has been banned. So it's also been banned in the US judiciary as also in NASA per se. But uh, still, because it's so easy to use, it's increasingly becoming the toast of the times. But in India, when you are now going to deal with the electronic evidence and uh, video conferencing, there are going to be big challenges. Well, when I will use Zoom, I can do my own recording here. Uh, the court will do its own recording. Now, in case of it's a hearing by video conferencing, any party would be entitled to an inspection of the said, because at the end of the day, this video conferencing hearing would be an electronic record, which means it will have to be not just retained, but also protected and preserved in accordance with the requirements under the Information Technology Act 2000 and under the Indian Evidence Act. And mind you, whatever this electronic evidence that's getting generated during video conferencing or during COVID-19 times will still have to substantially comply with the requirements of Section 65B of the Indian Evidence Act as mandated by the landmark judgment of Anwar PV versus PK Bashir. It's indeed correct that the current uh, issue of Anwar PV versus PK Bashir is pending before a bigger constitution bench. But till such time, the said bench does not come up with a more uh, definitive kind of a ruling. The law under Anwar versus Bashir shall continue to be the law of the land. <clears throat> I think we also have to look at the issue of uh, upholding the confidentiality of data that's going to be generated through video conferencing. And uh, normally, there's an implicit presumption that when we are on video conferencing, our data is fine, it's okay, it's secure, which is not necessary. Mr. Pawan? Yes, sir, I'm back. Uh, Zoom decided to suddenly log me out. So I Probably can't... somebody from Zoom heard you. <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir, continue, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Trying to say that while uh, we uh, get this online, uh, video conferencing is going to bring across immense amount of challenges. So till such time, the Supreme Court does not really clarify well, the Supreme Court has said, yes, uh, that this is uh, the de facto uh, need of the hour that all video conferencing uh, proceedings will be legal and valid. But there will still be issues pertaining to the cybersecurity ramifications and the electronic evidence issues pertaining to the same. Um, I was saying that uh, the electronic evidence issues pertaining to uh, this entire issue of uh, video conferencing will have to be specifically looked at and dealt by uh, both the judiciary and also by lawyers as we go forward. Whether it will be conducive or for you as lawyers to talk with your clients uh, via video conferencing, well, that's your call. But the fact is, you'll have to be careful. So, you know, we've created a lot of online courses. Here is uh, some of the online courses that I've created on Cyber Law University called Coronavirus, Work From Home and Legal Issues and also cyber law, cyber crime, and cyber security in the coronavirus age. So currently we're offering about 31 different courses on the cyber law university, all about different aspects of uh, cyber law. And these courses have, uh, as of now in the last two and a half years, got more than uh, 19,000 students or uh, participants from 168 countries. Here are specific courses on cyber crime, on social media, and cyber law per se. This is what people talk about uh, my law firm. Well, as a lawyer who's working specifically in this space, I believe each day is a new day. We keep on learning every day. Why? Because uh, uh, there's new nuances. In the lockdown, we've seen so many of these distinctive new changes and challenges that have come in. We've ended up doing a lot of compliances for companies who have suddenly realized that they are non-compliant with law. So we help companies with compliances, of course, a lot of litigation, and of course, all kinds of advisories per se in this regard. I just finally like to conclude by saying, look, there's no running away from cyber law. This is going to be an integral part of our lives, whatever 
the discipline of uh, legal practice that you are in, whatever kind of matters that you as judicial officers will be dealing with. Because we have to understand two things. Number one, in the COVID-19 times, almost every electronic, uh, every evidence that's emerged pertaining to disputes will be electronic because people were on online. Number two, there's going to be a big wave of litigation coming in once COVID-19 comes to a close. So in a scenario like that, every evidence that's going to be invariably coming forward will be electronic evidence. So appropriate compliances under the law will have to be done. So all, all in all, cyber law and cyber crime today represent important, fascinating aspects of our lives. But if you're expecting law to come to your uh, rescue every time you're attacked, then you're going to be mistaken. We will have to start proactively protecting our own selves, our own data, our data of our clients as we move forward, because cybercrime is not going to spare anyone. Cybersecurity breaches are increasingly now targeting the legal fraternity, the judicial fraternity. And I will see more and more of these cases happening in the coming times. So let's start adopting a culture of cybersecurity as a part of our lives. Let's not expect the government to make our stuff uh, more cyber secure. Whatever we can do in terms of having adequate safeguards, in terms of having adequate firewalls, um, adequate antivirus programs, and basically taking backups. Those will be important issues because once your client information is gone, uh, it has immense ramification for you as a lawyer because it could potentially expose you to legal liability. In the US right now, in the last 10 days, a law firm has been sued by a client because of a data breach that's taken place during the COVID-19 times at uh, the law firm. And because of the dead data breach, the client is saying that I've suffered millions of dollars. Therefore, as a law firm, you please indemnify me and give me back my millions of dollars. So very interesting times, but I believe all said and done, these are irreversible game-changing phenomenons that we will have to be more cognizant with. Uh, COVID-19 is a part of our lives. Let's start recognizing these increasing cyber crimes and cybersecurity breaches, and then try to adopt our own customized and ingenious approaches that we can so as to uh, deal with these various legal ch challenges. And from the legal fraternity, just keep your belts more tightened. I expect a new wave of litigation coming in. And that's a big wave where all lawyers must be prepared to capture that wave because uh, that kind of wave, wave we would not have seen in the last few decades. So interesting times, but interesting challenges as we go forward. That's all from my side. I'll be happy to answer any specific questions. Over to you, Mr. Chairman. Justice Vaidhi Nagan, sir. Uh, very nice, you know, uh, you know, you put it in very nutshell and uh, the problems, you know, that is going to arise in future on account of this uh, uh, cybersecurity and that all must be very careful. Uh, you know, we are going to live with Corona. So also we have to live with this uh, and the cyber crimes that may arise. Um, and uh, since uh, it is a uh, beginning stage, uh, I think you have given it in brief. I think we will have to hear you in detail, depending upon the questions that may be posed by the viewers here. And uh, Justice Nagamutu, Justice Anand Venkatesh, and some of the judicial officers like Christopher Ambiga and others are there, including Deepthi, uh, are there. And they may pose all those questions apart from the lawyers. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Srinivas Raghavan and Hemalata, for uh, making, you know, uh, asking uh, Mr. Dugal to address on the uh, new subject, which is very, very important in the present day. Thank you. Really, sir, Dr. Pawan's uh, lecture was very educative and informative, and we should thank him for uh, accepting the invitation that to on a Sunday morning. Uh, let me move to NABG, sir. Good morning, Mr. Pawan. Uh, um, the more I listen to uh, lectures like this, the more I get terrified. Uh, that uh, that uh, seems to be the See, um, I have two, three things to ask. More than the law, I, I thought uh, whether we are actually understanding. Mr. Pawan, what is your uh, opinion with regard to this question as to whether the cyberspace is actually a different space altogether? The reason why I'm asking you this question is, 
uh, take for instance a person who is chatting with a group he in person will not react in the same way as he is reacting in a chat which i always call it call it as a cyber space so therefore if is cyber space a completely different space altogether where it basically makes a human being act quite differently than what he used to act when he is under a normal atmosphere thank you sir i think uh, cyber space is a different world altogether initially uh, when this entire concept of cyber space got developed we we were uh, conceptualizing it as a space that's existing on top of these uh, uh, the network lines that were existing right now it's an imaginary space it's a virtual space but yes it's a space where cognitive cogent actions take place but the fact is most of the users online today believe that internet provides them complete anonymity so they could potentially hide behind the cloak of anonymity and do whatever they want to do which they cannot do in the real world so that's the reason why people tend to often take down their guards be at their worst and their uh, sadistic best uh, when they are specifically on uh, cyberspace somehow they get a feeling they cannot be tracked which is completely inaccurate today there is so much of monitoring happening every of your activity is getting logged down by the service provider not just by your internet service provider by your broadband service provider but also by the service provider or the platform where you are going and accessing whether it's a google whether it's facebook or instagram so i believe people have to just come out of this mistaken notion that they can do what they really want to do because they can still be identified but today what's happening is there are large number of these new tools that's come up which i call as the anonymizers these are tools which help you to anonymize your presence to uh, go ahead and obliterate electronic footprints of yours now because of these tools people tend to get a feeling that they can be invincible and they cannot be touched well to a large extent they may be correct but then increasingly technologies are happening but what really happens now when people go on to the dark net i know of um, a particular client of mine who's gone on the dark net and has engaged in all kinds of uh, cyber criminal activities because he's come and sought my advice as to what he needs to be doing uh, should he be caught now uh, i believe people need to be made more sensitized first and foremost internet as a paradigm never sleeps internet as a phenomenon never forgets whatever it's up online will be there for a long long period of time last 25 years we've been repeatedly trying to get things completely off the internet for various clients we are successful in some cases not successful in others because if the service provider is within india then things could still be more amenable but in case if you are a vpn service provider you just refuse to acknowledge any kind of a legal uh, process of any kind whatsoever so i believe people have to be more sensitized yes these are initial growing times there are in increasing uh, maturity uh, issues that are coming in but as people become more mature they will potentially stop doing all these activities but expecting this will completely stop so will not necessarily happen we will still have uh, be having these elements like now in during the uh, national lockdown a lot of new entrants have joined on to the digital bandwagon expecting them to have overnight uh, maturity will not necessarily happen they will end up uh, doing these kinds of um, elements online but i believe that over a period of time it uh, might be possible that these kind of activities would potentially be slightly lessened but cyberspace is here to stay it's legally recognized and all activities therein are already being brought within the ambit of legal frameworks and legal processes thanks sir so the the reason why i asked you this question is before we talk about uh, getting aware of or being careful in handling all these things i think basically we lack education in this the the awareness will come only if we start educating ourselves or else what happens is that we easily fall prey to these freebies that are being offered saying that and and most of those things which we download in our in our uh, in our pad or in our phone we pay for nothing we just download everything and start start using it so once that happens it it actually taps our weakness for these freebies so therefore whatever advice you give 
ultimately that weakness in the mind overwhelms everything and we fall for it so is it something which which has to be taught right from a very young age for people to get aware about it because we cannot avoid it hereafter it's like it is going to come with us it is going to rapidly improve is it it does it require real awareness from a very early stage failing which it is every time going to tag the weak side of the mind and whatever advice you give it is going to overwhelm it so you bang on target i have been talking for the last many years now it's time that we will have to start making cyber law and cyber security education as part of school curriculum from the first standard onwards right now ugc says start studying cyber security after you finish your graduation in the post graduation i think those mindsets have to change because as indians we have been intrinsically changing ourselves we have been getting more busy we have not have been having more time for our children so we have been thrusting them with the internet connected devices in a way to quieten them so that they don't eat our heads and we can be free to do our respective activities now i know of a personal case of mine one of my friends niece was born and uh, she was uh, well she was when four months old her parents decided to give her a toy and the toy was an ipad mini connected oh. to okay. now this is at a time when the child is only four months old by the time the child was six months old the child was far more proficient with dealing with ipad mini uh, than her own parents by the time she was 9 months old she was shown a photograph of paper photograph of 20 years back and this child mind you at 9 months had not spoken her first word in her life started doing this on the paper uh, photograph expecting that it's going to be expanded expanded so i i believe this is just telling you that the dna is changing this new generation is very very adaptive but because we are thrusting them with these devices we are effectively putting them into hot deep waters without even empowering them on how to protect themselves i've uh, seen uh, i've done cases for clients uh, one of my clients uh, son who's about 5 and 1/2 years old uh, have was successful in hacking into his own com- his own school's network and post oh. completely derogatory message to the principal of the school at 5 and 1/2 years and that to using the wifi of the school now if that's the kind of the new age that we are working in i believe education and awareness has to be the only mantra and i think it does not even need to start in the school it needs to start uh, from homes today most of the in most of the homes during lockdowns people are drifting away i tell people look when you are on the dining table don't take any cyber case and start discussing with your with your children this has been reported what what do you have to say and start listening to see how they are uh, thinking about that could enable them to come out of their shell and we could proactively try to guide them through this generation doesn't want to be taught they believe that all their parents are uh, fools they don't know anything on uh, cyberspace and these guys are the most intelligent so we will have to actually handle them more intelligently intelligently i believe more sensitization uh, more capacity building more awareness and more empowerment have to be the only way going forward in this regard sir thank uh, you my last question is uh, can real relationships be formed in cyberspace sir i've never seen in my last uh, 25 years any real relationships being formed in cyberspace cyberspace relationships are always vested relationships you are either hungry for fame you are hungry for friends you are hungry for followers and therefore these temporary temporal uh, arrangements do take place but i've yet to see long lasting relationships primarily because cyberspace if you only do relationships in cyberspace it lacks the intrinsic ability for humans to connect intrinsically as humans yes i may be counting you or counting my 5000 followers or 10000 followers but maybe in terms of long friendships i may not even have two or three so i believe cyberspace right now has not much evolved but with yes now with more behavioral approaches happening it could be a different ball game altogether for example there's a new app now that's being developed that is going to use artificial intelligence in order to enable you to find your real and ideal date online so if that's the new space that's happening uh, maybe ai may slightly uh, change things but at the end of the day there will be no substitute to human interaction to human behavior yes you could meet somebody online but if you till such time you don't really are able to connect in person 
you are not really uh, able to form long lasting bonding relationships which i believe can only happen through real contact but of course things are changing it's too early to say or give judgment in this regard sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank you um so let's move to the question session sir if you don't mind yes, first is from uh, palan navil uh, rajan he says is it mandatory that i move the designated officer to block a video or content and then move the honorable court under section 69a of the information technology act 2000 well blocking has been given under section 69a of the it act the blocking uh, request has to be personally made before going to the court of law uh, typically what happens is there's a particular committee that's formed uh, headed by a joint secretary now you you have to first move a request before that particular committee before you go to court of law now if you don't do that and come directly to court sometimes the court takes the opinion that look you have not exhausted the remedies which you were given to you earlier uh, including under section 69a did you go to the concerned committee at least if you would have written and they have done nothing no problem the court will then assume uh, shall i say jurisprudence or jurisdiction on the matter but uh, sometimes the courts uh, realize that the urgency of the matter and that it will be of no real uh, utility of going to the com committee therefore the courts in number of cases take so much to action and say look even if you have not gone to um, the designated authority or the officer not a problem i as the the court of law having the appropriate power here by direct that the particular content be blocked however having said that we need to appreciate that blocking is a very very kind of a temporary uh, uh, phenomenon and blocking more than anything else does far more damage in the long run than actual benefit because when you get an order for blocking from a particular court you invariably are seeking to do what you are seeking to block a particular content and when you uh, try to block that content law people get very curious they want to find out what was so special in the content that was going to be blocked up and consequently a uh, lot of traffic tends to get diverted to the said blocked content per se so i think you will have to be taking your own chances to say how effective is blocking but yes currently this is the legal process that you will have to keep in mind as you go forward i go on to the next question sir the next question is uh, coming up and this is again from uh, rajesh shekhar he says but indian uh, police are not well versed with cyber law and cyber security government has to provide more training apart from a constable sir you are bang on target i can't agree more with you the need for capacity building in the country is massive and uh, this need can only be appropriately addressed if there are appropriate programs in this regard now i know that some programs good work is being done under the uh, national judicial academy the state judicial academies the national police academy but by and large i believe given the the size of the country the size of the judiciary side of the law enforcement agencies i think far more capacity building is required to be done because uh, today going to a normal police inspector trying to get a cyber crime registered is such a tall challenge it invariably does not happen so there's ultimately need for far more capacity building in that regard there's a question sir from galaxy j7 uh, which says is pornography illegal in the country sure. if why well good question more than 52% of the total content online is pornographic so if that is a position then uh, is pornography legal illegal in the country well let me make a nuanced distinction the law does not ban or make pornography illegal in the country in fact there is no law passed by parliament which makes watching of pornography as illegal the law is only concerned with the publication the transmission or the causing to be published or transmitted in the electronic form of obscene electronic content as an offense that's an offense under section 67 a uh, 67 of the it act that's an offense pertaining to the actual world under 292 of the indian penal code minus the electronic format that's ultimately going back to the hicklin test of 1830s uh, and the hicklin test which was adopted by the supreme court in uh, ranjit deshi versus state of maharashtra 1971 now by and large it effectively means that when i am only transmitting or i am publishing does the law come into force if i am watching pornography on my mobile that's not an offense 
But once I save a copy of the same on my mobile, that becomes an offense. Once I share it or uh, send it on social media, that becomes an offense. Or even if I do any act which causes to be published or transmitted in the electronic form, that becomes an offense. Similarly, when I capture the private moments of somebody else uh, on my mobile phone, uh, that also, incidentally, is an offense under Section 67A of the IT Act. But Section 67B of the IT Act even goes much beyond. It says, even when you browse child pornography, it becomes an offense. Now, that's a problem. How can you, uh, on reading the name of a domain, understand whether it will have child pornography content or not? It's like a catch-all kind of a net situation that Section 67B has provided. So, uh, it, as of now, even makes browsing uh, as an offense, but only of child pornography. And child is defined as anybody below the age of 18 years. So, that's the current state that India has currently chosen. I believe uh, that the law pertaining to um, obscenity needs to have a revisit, primarily because the ground realities have changed. Uh, I go on to the next question. Uh, this is a question, sir, from Mr. Rajiv Gupta. He says, yes, so cyber security is concerned, can we leave it entirely to the government to manage? Or is it possible for the government to manage it without violating right or privacy? First and foremost, cyber security is not a governmental baby, nor a governmental responsibility. Cyber security is our own responsibility. Once we start having that basic, it's very clear. Uh, the, the vision starts getting more clarified. You see, we are all part of a chain. And the chain is as strong as the weakest link. So in case if we are going to be weak in terms of cyber security on I, my network, on my devices, that could ultimately land up compromising the cyber security of the entire network or the systems per se. Uh, the government has huge number of other responsibilities. So straddling them with the responsibility of cyber security, though could be a good initial starting point, but may not ultimately be the most effective way forward. I think everybody has to be sensitized about uh, cyber security. Cyber security education needs to be more uh, made more broad spread. And uh, in case if you're going to leave everything on cyber security to the government, there is a challenge because it could land up to uh, violating the right of privacy of individuals. Now, Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India judgment of the Supreme Court says that we all have a fundamental right to privacy under Article 21 of the Constitution. So the government can only now uh, take this right away from me, except in accordance with the procedure established by law, which means a procedure established by a uh, uh, legal legislation passed by parliament. Now, technically, there are bound to be some conflicts because if the government is going to be made completely responsible for cybersecurity, then it is going to be putting into place various parameters that could be having an infringing impact upon the right to privacy. That needs to be kept in mind. But government alone is not the only stakeholder. Today, for example, a majority of the telecommunication is in the private hands. A majority of the banking also is some, somewhat in private hands. Insurances in private hands. So I believe the private stakeholder has to be equally made responsible for cybersecurity as we go forward. Sir. So next question we have of Mr. Raj. He says the cyberspace must be countrywide contained, which Russian government had started implementing. Nowadays, four-year-old boys playing online games using his parents' mobile. Uh, I think, sir, you're buying on target. You're talking about localization. Mm. Data localization is also a very, very contentious issue. Russia had passed a law on data localization saying, sir, if you want to do any business with Russians, please ensure that the Russian data is physically located within the territorial boundaries of Russia. China has come up with a similar data localization law. Vietnam has a similar data localization law. So I think the data localization laws are nothing but steps towards uh, shall I say, bifurcation of the internet. You are going to see balkanization of the internet happening. But it may not be a, a very effective solution long term. For example, even when I look at the Personal Data Protection Bill of 2019, which is pending before the Joint Parliamentary Committee, we find that uh, there is a provision. Earlier, the government was saying that data will have to be physically in India. Now, the, uh, the revised version, which is put up before Parliament said, no, no, sir. We are okay with our data outside. Just give me a serving copy in India. I think we are also changing our stance. So we need to get very clarity. Data is the new oil of the new data economy. 
Therefore, we have to start understanding the importance of data and its impact upon not just national sovereignty, security or integrity, but even upon the cyber sovereignty interests of countries. And I believe increasingly, more and more countries should be going towards data localization, though that may not be the best way going forward. But then there's nothing known as a utopian world. Today, countries are more actuated by protecting their own national interests rather than anything else. Yes, a lot of children are playing online games using their parents' mobile, which is opening up a new Pandora's box. We had a case during the lockdown where uh, one of our clients uh, were visited by the police because it appeared that the, the client's son had misused the home Wi-Fi for doing a criminal activity. And the police landed up not just uh, ultimately zeroing down on the son, but also picking up the, the parent, the father, in whose name the internet connection was. And the law is very clear. If you are a holder of an internet connection and that connection gets misused for criminal activity, then you equally get sucked into a potential legal liability. It's only at the stage of trial that you will have to show that I had nothing to do with this or that I, I was a network service provider or I was an intermediary or I had done my due diligence under the law. But that's all later. But it's increasingly clear that more and more children without any specific intentions but are increasingly endangering their own, um, shall I say, parents to potential legal consequences. Thanks, sir. My next question is uh, coming from Mr. Chokalingam M. He says, by studying cyber law, can it be said to be a panacea for all problems? No, sir. Cyber law cannot be said to be a panacea for all the problems. It's only one of the many, uh, shall I say, tools that you need to have in your arsenal. But increasingly, that will be a very important tool in whatever practice area that you're going to be. Because now clients are going to come to you with electronic evidence, with digital uh, related nuances. So if you are not able to effectively address them, then tomorrow it could potentially have a prejudicial impact upon protecting the rights of your Yes, Knowing cyber law becomes an important prerequisite. You can no longer say, look, I'm a taxation lawyer. I'm a property lawyer. I don't need to know anything about cyber law. Now you would be required to know about cyber law because your clients are telling you uh, that, look, my evidence is in the electronic form. I'm communicating you on WhatsApp, on uh, Signal, on Telegram. So uh, tell me, my wife's phone has got this incriminating content. What should I do? So I think we will have to slightly keep on enhancing our skill sets on uh, cyber in along with all your other uh, practice areas per se. Uh, there's a question, sir, from uh, Advocate Baladevan. He says cyberspace, it started in the last 15 years. Actually, sir, cyberspace started not 15 years back. It started way back in 1969 when ARPANET came across, which was the first time mm, as a military uh, network. And this concept of a cyberspace started evolving in the early 70s. By the time this particular military network was adopted to academic universities and institutions, the concept of cyberspace was growing, but it was slow. It was only the early 90s with the coming of the World Wide Web that the entire scenario of accessing the internet changed. It made internet accessing so easy that any child could do That's where the concept of cyberspace started getting far more uh, predominance. But from a legal standpoint, it was the state of Utah uh, that came up with its first cyber law in the year 1996 that really started giving legal recognition to the concept of cyberspace. Then in January, 30th January uh, 1997, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations had passed the UNCTAD model law on electronic commerce asking all its member states to come up with national legislations to deal with cyberspace. And that's where I believe cyberspace issues started uh, getting more legal sanctity. So then there's another question from, uh, uh, again, Advocate Bala Devan who says, everything is possible in cyberspace, darknet. Sir, you are correct. Everything is possible. Go to the darknet and think of the most heinous kind of criminal activities that you can ever perceive, and you will find them all there. You go to the darknet, there's a website which says that we can kill anybody in the world, barring the top 10 most powerful people in the world, and barring women and children. So they are willing to take cyber suparis for killing anyone. They, uh, they can hack at gay abandon. They can do all kinds of criminal activities. And today, 
it's so easy. Cybercrime as a service has evolved, which has said, look, don't dirty your hands. Outsource your cybercriminal activity to professionals. They will do it for you. So I think everything is possible. All kinds of narcotic, psychotropic substances are happening. Nowadays, what's started happening is countries and state actors have also started going to the dark net and started using these dark net actors for launching cybersecurity breaches and attacks at various adversaries or other nations. So, sir, everything is possible. But I think with now artificial intelligence coming in, it will become even more easy and possible. There are a couple of websites on the uh, dark net that are offering various cybercrime services based on artificial intelligence. In fact, that's the USP. They uh, were, were going to charge you a bit more in Bitcoins because they're using artificial intelligence for the purposes of doing their cybercriminal activities. Uh, I'm, so there's another question here from uh, Mr. Veera Akash. He says, uh, I'm currently doing my final year BA LLB course. I'm looking forward to gain knowledge and excel in cyber laws. Could you kindly guide me the postgraduate course which I should uh, pursue to learn more about this subject? Sir, I think once you've done your BA LLB, you are all ready uh, to embrace cyber law. It's a good idea that you should do some kind of a postgraduate course. There are a couple of these postgraduate courses are available. Now, you could either do an LLM on cyber law if you really want to go deep. And there are some universities like there is uh, the UPS in uh, Dehradun, or University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, that's providing a distinctive uh, LLM on cyber law. Further, you have got various postgraduate diplomas and certificates on cyber law that are being offered by uh, Nalsar in uh, Hyderabad, by the National Law University in uh, Bangalore, and even by the Indian Law Institute in uh, New Delhi. So you can pick and choose which one do you really want to do. It's a good idea to understand that cyber law is constantly evolving. It might be a good idea to start focusing on a particular aspect in cyber law because it's getting very broad and ultimately super specialization will have to be the norm of the day as you go forward. So thank you. I hope I would have answered that question. There's another question from Mr. Ravi Ananta Padma. He says two questions that I have. As I've appeared in one of the sensitive CBI cases, I have been given to understand that my mobile and, hand, and home landlines are tapped. It echoes at particular time and with specific numbers only. Is it legal to be done by CBI? How to prevent it? Well, unfortunately, you have uh, now pointed out to a very stark ground reality that lawyers like us face when we are dealing with these matters. A lot of time, these law enforcement agencies are illegally tapping your uh, phones. They would not be officially tapping it, but they'll be illegally tapping it because they would want to know more about what you are doing in terms of trying to protect your client per se. Well, the only best way to do is uh, you, you will have to start living with it, but be consciously clear of what you talk on these headphones. And if you really have to talk sensitive, please don't talk on the landline or on a mobile phones. Please look at some of these more very interesting options that are currently available. I can refer you uh, the option of Signal and Telegram. Signal, I believe, is the most comprehensively secure end-to-end -end encrypted uh, over-the-top application that I believe lawyers must use today because uh, Signal is so particular about protecting your privacy. It does not even give your details of your communication to any governments. So much so that Australia had passed uh, in about 18 months back its law on uh, encryption, uh, which anti-encryption, which said, look, if you are using encryption, you will have to give the backend keys to the Australian government. Signal said to the Australian government, sir, we are quitting Australia. We don't want to do business in your country because we don't want to follow your law. We will not be giving you our backend keys. So coming back to your question, if you have to really talk sensitive, talk on applications like Telegram, don't talk on your uh, normal uh, land, landlines. Well, if you, even if you want to make a, uh, shall I say, a representation, you will have no proof to the fact that the CBI was effectively uh, going at and tapping you. But yes, if the eco is taking place, that should just be a signal to you as an intelligent person. Yes, you are under tap. You are under interception. Realize that. Don't talk anything and don't ask your client to talk anything on at least the land phones. And it's a much better idea to start taking a new phone, uh, a new number, preferably under not your own name. Also start get a feature phone. That Asha phone, which costs about 15 to 1600 rupees, that's your best bet because that's uh, going to best protect you 
in these uh, times? I hope you will have answered that question. There's a question from Mr. Palanil Rajan, pa Palanil uh, Rajan, who says, how do we promote parent tap interface control in India, uh, parental con uh, interface control in India when compared to other countries? Uh, okay. Parental control is now a dream that's gone by. If you think that you would be controlling as a parent activities of your children, just forget it. That's just not going to happen. Today's children are far more intelligent, far more focused, and they know once you put in this parental control software, they will find indirect ways of bypassing the same. And now with so much of these uh, virtual private networks coming in, these parental control softwares are not getting very, very effective. And I believe the time of parental control was what, 90s, 2000s, in 2020, I believe the focus will more have to be on sensitization, on uh, trying to talk to them as friends rather than parental control. Because even if you do these parental control softwares, I find most of them are not very effective. But even if they are effective, children have different ways of by, by, bypassing the same. So I think you will have to look at more innovative approaches in this regard. Thanks. There's another question from Ravi Ananta Padmanabhan. He says, whenever we browse some apps like Amazon, Flipkart, Netflix, and sign out, I get pictures and ads relating to what I've seen and read. How to prevent data. Would you kindly invite? Is this about big data? Yes, sir. This is all about big data. Please mm -hmm. understand, you are today being respected. Not because you are an individual, not because you have been a professional who is accomplished in your area. You are respected because you are a data entity. You are constantly churning out data. In fact, internet has transformed all of us into global authors, global transmitters, and global broadcasters of data. So we are generating data all the time. So the data what we are generating on these apps like Flipkart and Amazon is constantly getting monitored, and that's been collected at one place. Now then the big data algorithms are being used for purposes of identifying what are your uh, core uh, search elements, your thrust areas, your hobbies, or what are you searching for? And then keeping those things in mind, specifically focused ads are specifically uh, being brought in that regard. Therefore, I think the better thing will be, uh, you will have to, number one, start living with it. Number two, if you want to be very, very um, particular about doing things, then it might be a good idea to start using some virtual private networks on your uh, facilities and uh, try as far as possible to get, give minimal permissions Go back to your applications uh, settings on your mobiles or your desktop. See how best can you protect your and preserve your privacy. There are a lot of these advanced settings that you could potentially be activating so that this kind of monitoring or thrusting you with these ads could be reduced to the best extent possible. But in case if you're expecting uh, utopia and all of these things to disappear, that may not completely happen, sir. Uh, but I believe uh, the more protected we can make ourselves, the better it will be. Uh, thanks, sir. I think uh, uh, I, there's one more uh, question. This is again, now we put up by Mr. Veera Akash Shivashankar. He same said, question. Sir. Same mm. question? Yeah. He okay. said he wants to do something persuasive. Uh, you know, he's, put up, he's put up with the second question saying, sir, while there is no law passed by the parliament. Sir, please, please answer, sir. Please answer. Yeah. Uh, a bill introduced with regard to data security and data localization. The privacy insured by Article 21 is not effectively insured. Well, I believe uh, the Data Protection Bill 2019 today requires a revisit. The times of December 2019 have gone. The ground realities of May 2020 are completely different. Lockdown, COVID-19 has changed our perspectives, has changed the way how people access uh, data, generate data, share data, or deal with data. Hence, I believe a lot of elements of the personal data protection bill would now have to be revisited, keeping in mind the specific learnings of the COVID-19 period. Otherwise, uh, the potentiality of such provisions impacting the fundamental right to privacy could be coming up and we could see a plethora of litigation in this regard. I hope, sir, that will uh, answer your question. Uh, there's a question, sir, from Sri Krishna Bala Subramaniam. He says, are there any private concern whom we can pay and ask them to work for us to ensure cyber security in our office. Sir, there are a number of people whom you could employ, but please remember a fundamental principle. 
you can outsource cyber security you cannot outsource the risks emanating from cyber security so number number of these vendors will help you to put up with various cyber security solutions uh, which can make your data more secure your networks more secure but ultimately the exposure is all going to be yours uh, so i will suggest that you should as far as possible play a very proactive role in understanding how best you can minimize your potential exposure to uh, legal risks there's a thanks another question from shri krishna bala subramaniam if cyber crime can be outsourced why can't cyber security be outsourced yes sir cyber security can be outsourced but as i said your risk in cyber security cannot be outsourced your uh, vendor is not going to go to jail tomorrow uh, should your your uh, cyber security be breached you as a legal entity could potentially be facing those legal headaches so i believe uh, outsource but outsource with care caution due diligence and after uh, having in place all requisite parameters of uh, care involved therein dr pawan Uh, just as Vimala retired, but also I could judge is waiting in the line. She wants to ask a question to you. As Vimala asked a question, should we have a law prohibiting access to the internet to children at least till the age of seven? Ma'am, it's a fascinating idea. But uh, first and foremost, it may not practically be workable because uh, no country in the world has come up with such a law. Assuming that we come up with such a law. how do we enforce the law because children today are more uh, addicted to internet as an opium rather than anything else i think it will be much more better if we can start focusing on having a law which is mandating the education about cyber nuances cyber security and cyber law for children rather than just saying that we'll be banning because i have seen that any incident or any legal instrument which says ban access that invariably uh, provides and gives uh, leads to more innovative approaches to bypass the law and who will enforce that law assuming that law gets passed who will enforce it whose duty will it be will the state authorities start coming and peeping inside every home find out whether any child has access or not and uh, so there'll be huge issues on uh, the logistic aspects the idea looks very good because we should protect our children because this time the children are very very vulnerable and unfortunately when they are seeing such huge volumes of pornography at the ages of 2 3 4 they are growing up with warped perceptions and images i think that's creating immense amount of practical societal challenges they are going to be growing out as perverts and uh, sexual maniacs so really we have a responsibility towards the children hey, it's a very very pragmatic answer but the other way is if the parents are made responsible if the child sees the pornography what is Why don't we make the parents responsible for that? That's a good idea, ma'am. That could definitely be exposed. But I will, uh, I would expect that a lot of parents are going to pose this idea to say, "Sir, we are not policemen. We have got ten other things to do, and therefore uh, putting the responsibility on us may not be the complete one." But yes, at the end of the day, ma'am, you are bang on target. Parents cannot wash away their responsibility. Ultimately, they are providing internet access. No outsider is, so they will have to either. be responsible for either putting in parental control software or sensitizing their children or ensuring that the browsing is done in their presence on their devices let the browsing be done in the uh, the drawing room no problem uh, so that everybody can while bypassing have a look what the child is going across the child should not have an expectation of a complete absolute privacy for accessing and doing anything online merely because he is a child or merely because his peer group believes that they can do anything so ma'am it's a great idea but it will have to be now more uh, focusedly advocated with the with the lawmakers in order to protect children because otherwise our this generation is going to be spoiled for all times to come sir thank you thank you so much like other fields of discipline ma'am in this discipline even today morning after 25 years into the space i find myself a complete novice i find you know that i eight hours i was sleeping last night so much has happened online and over the internet it becomes such a big tall task just to update yourself as to what's happening so i think this cyber law as a discipline has only told you uh, told me one thing that you know you are a student every day and you will continue to be a student till such time you die so keep on learning thank you dr pawan sir um, i would say one of the very satisfying session we ever had so 34th series and uh, it will be almost a top ranking session 
very illustrative very educative yeah, yeah. very informative and i should thank you i think sir i will just like to say one thing the time to be afraid from internet has gone internet mm. is now seeped into our daily lives we have to start accepting it as a ground reality the time of those luxuries of the internet has now gone it's time to do some serious reworking and reengineering vis-a-vis -vis our perspectives pertaining to the internet per se internet is going more and more uh, digital more and more digital economy will be a part of our lives our legal practices which have changed the least uh, in the last 200 years will now change the most in the next one decade so as uh, lawyers as judicial officers we just have to tighten our belts we just have to uh, be open to these new challenges uh, we'll have to come up with new mindsets we will have to start incorporating cyber security as a way of life we will have to start excelling in whatever areas of work or legal practice uh, that we have uh, identified for ourselves to do but at the same time keep on building our digital skill sets because i believe with the passage of time digital evidence is already going to be an integral part of your practice in whatever area of work that you're doing and as judicial officers you will now be inundated with all kinds of uh, electronic evidences and therefore the need for uh, more proactive approaches on how to deal with electronic evidence will be a topmost priorities i think at a time when uh, the uk or uh, from whom we copied section 65b of the evidence act and which uk repealed in 2006 we are still continuing with the same old provision on 2020 i believe new perspectives are required for electronic evidence new mindsets are required for uh, dealing with cyber crime we should not be uh, tomorrow going to uh, panicky or tizzy once we realize we have become a victim of cyber crime no problem i think everybody of us will at some point of time in life becoming a victim of cyber crime let's take it as a learning lesson and then let's try to protect our own data do our own backups try as far as possible because our digital reputation is far far more fragile than our actual world reputations and all it's going to take is just a couple of steps to completely shatter or prejudicially impact your digital reputation hence i believe we will have to start being more sensitive to what we are doing online what electronic traces we are leaving behind online we should also be sensitive on how we are going to deal with our clients clients are no longer going to be trustworthy you may have good uh, you have been lucky you got old clients great but now the internet uh, ecosystem has made clients um, with fishy in their thought processes so the clients are also recording you please realize we have now entered into a new world where everybody is into the recording mode everybody is recording everybody so you will have to be careful of what you speak when where how what kind of electronic footprints are you leaving behind because i expect now a new wave of litigation coming in where not only lawyers will be defending clients but all of lawyers would themselves be finding themselves becoming a a kind of an unnecessary party to litigations per se but let's not be uh, panicky let's not be uh, afraid of cyberspace this is going to be here for stay for all times to come let's try to open our mindsets and come up with new approaches to deal with the very nuanced uh, changes that are happening in cyberspace today we are in 2020 if we were in 2050 and if you were to write a book on cyber law on in 2050 globally and if that book was to be of 100 pages then in 2020 may we are only on the 7th or the 8th page most of these next 90 plus pages have yet to be written in the next few decades so let's wait for these new developments let's be part of them and let's see how the evolution of your students takes place pertaining to not just cyber space but also newly emerging technologies like artificial intelligence blockchain and internet of things thanks sir thank you dr pavan i should thank justice vaidyanathan for having instrumental in bringing yourself as a chief uh, resource person on the topic thank you very much dr thank, thank you i'd like to uh, thank justice vaidyanathan for uh, connecting me to you and uh, thank you to you and your distinguished audience for sparing such time on on a sunday morning and listening to these perspectives it's been a great learning experience for me thank you for giving me this opportunity and i'm always available if you require any inputs from my side i'll be available on email on phone please feel free to connect and we'll be happy to i'll be happy to contribute in any manner i could but thank you once again sir sure sir thank you very much thanks a lot